Welcome to my presentation about mixed reality and how this is shaping or can shape our field of view. But first of all, I want to introduce you to this friend of mine here. Oh, can you? Oh well, all right, so this friend of mine here, can you see her? Ah, it's, it's a bit, all right, there she is. Okay. Oh yeah, maybe that, shut this place, yeah. Okay. So this was how um, the people from the educational department and for educational development and uh, technology of ETH welcomed their visitors to the last refresh teaching event with this nice girl here. And it was an event about getting mixed reality into education and how this could work. And, but first of all, maybe I can check the basics. Who has no idea about augmented reality, mixed reality, and things like that? Who's never heard of it before? All right, that's very good. And who knows uh, exactly what they are and what the distinctions are? Okay, good. Then we'll go about the quickly. So, wait, let's. So we, it's easiest to think of it as a spectrum. So you have reality on one end. Let's assume we know what this is. And then on the other hand, we have virtual reality. And in between you have augmented and augmented reality and augmented virtuality. So augmented reality is um, if you have the real world, you see the real world, for example, Pokemon Go, right? We know that. And you have a device which is able to overlay images or objects into the world, but they're usually very easy detectable. So they turn with you if you, for example, walk around, so you always have the same thing facing you. And then you have virtual reality. This is completely immersive. You don't see the real world anymore. You walk into tables if you walk around. That's why people usually sit down, so they do not injure themselves. Uh, Google Cardboard is an example for it, or Oculus Rift. And then there is mixed reality. This is something of a newer, or no, it's a term that's not really um, specific because there's lots of different definitions. But the one I'll go with is that it's, um, you have certain mixed presence. You're in the real world, you see the real world, but you get objects inside of it, and they're especially um, entered. So you can walk around it and it doesn't shift. So it stays in place. And if you come back into space, it's still there if you didn't delete it or something. So the, this one, that's Microsoft HoloLens. That's the a very uh, prominent example right now. Uh, Meta 2 by Meta is also another example. And I put Magic Leap there because that's something people know sometimes, but it's not something that has been released yet. So that's just there for reference. So what can you do with this now? Um, for example, games, right? That's the first thing you usually think of. So this is uh, one of a TED Talk example. And yeah, you can, I mean, this one here is imaginative, obviously. 
So that's the difficult part. And the thing is, because the technology is quite flexible, so you can basically put anything into space, and it's intuitive. So I showed this over the weekend, I showed this to my mom, and she, I'm still explaining to her how smartphones work, but she got this quite quickly. It's clicking and you're done. So that makes it quite universal because you have lots of people who can actually use it. Then we have education. So So for tourism, it's also an option. People think about it, how to use it, because it's hands-free. For example, you, could, you don't need your hands. You can carry your baggage with it, and you can just walk around and have added information in places. So you might not need a tour guide anymore. You can just have this one here. Then in education, the one I sh uh, the refresh teaching event, they also showed us a, an example of what has that now? Um, this is also an application developed by uh, ETH collaboration with some um, with another f with a com company and they made a um, you can put molecules in space and you can uh, observe their uh, shape and walk around it and it's, it's because it's they're quite complex as you see and it's more easy to see them if you can walk around them and discuss about it and as you can also see there are several people so you can have if three people uh, wear a hololens and you enter the object in space then you can discuss about it so collaborative as well. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. <laughs> also for field operations, um, be able, because you're hands-free and you can make the invisible visible. So, okay, this would have been an example of um, people making tubes in the ground visible. So, for example, for uh, people having to fix them, they can see where there is something wrong. They might have, for example, a heat image um, overlaid, so they can see where there is a problem with the heating, example, for example. So, this is that. And then urban planning, that's quite an interesting thing as well, because you can also go out into, um, into the real world and have it displayed. As for example, you have first, you can have it in the room on a model, and, but you can also go outside and have it superimposed on the real world and imagine how things would look like. And because it's collaborative again, you can talk about this, discuss about it, and visualize in the invisible. So you can have, for example, uh, tubes again and ground. Yes. And the last one for now is training. So this one is from the medic medical field, if it works. So you could train people on how they they use technical, uh, complex technical equipment. You can train them directly how they can use them. So now we have this list of uh, applications and uh, features which make it interesting to use them. But this is all applications that happen now. And if you work with the technology, you realize it's a bit, uh, doesn't work that well yet. Did you have bugs everywhere? And it's really just at the beginning. So people, some people say it's just a hype. They'll go back, I mean, 
who's going to wear this on their head and it doesn't even work. And then there are people who say, this is the new Android. So, well, if it's just a hype, then yeah, you don't have to care that much about it. But if it's the new Android, then it makes actually think to, sense to think about it, what this means for society, if it really gets, um, especially if it gets more cheap, it gets cheaper. And because it's also personalizable, right? So everyone wears this, so you can adjust it to every person. And because it's intuitive and easy to use for everyone, it will can be quite, it's also ubiquitous, so it will be everywhere. And if everyone gets to have one, this is from a comic that I like to read. Uh, it's called Space Boy. And here he imagines people, this is, those are the glasses, and he imagines everyone gets an avatar. He can have, make themselves tails or whatever. So you can sort of enhance yourself or in your life. Now, what does this mean, right? So there are various implications, like we said, for spatial planning, for example. Here, people are thinking about making this for participative planning, for example. This is very interesting because you can show it to the public what you're thinking about, what the possible implications would be, and you can, yeah, you can especially you can discuss about it. Also, there's this added value I put there because, I mean, most of these applications are for added value, right? You want to make training easier, you want to have fun, you want to be traveling with more information, you want to have better education at more places available for more people, you want to make a, a field operation easier. And this might also change our environment. So I found this video on, now I sure hope this, of course. <laughs> So this is about this guy who has, in his eyes, he has those, um, his lenses, which are basically this. And he gets, he's on a date with this girl, and he gets all kinds of information about her, and what her uh, alcohol level is, what he should do next, and he eventually basically almost succeeds in, uh, yeah. Getting her to go home. And you can already see he has nothing in his house, right? It's empty. Because pictures, he has them in, the, in, his, in his lenses. He has all the decorations. He doesn't need them anymore. He has them in his eyes. So this might, for example, for sustainability, this is interesting. Well, sort of. He might, it's, it's very uh, just visionary. Then... Also have no. um, but then there is also negative parts. So for example, you're always collecting data. So you can actually track what this is recording, what you're seeing with this. You can track if you have if you combine it with, for example, face recognition, you can see what people's interests are. And so this is actually quite a challenge for privacy, especially for people who just walk by, because they, they don't have the technology, but they might still get their face recorded, they might get video recorded, this is a camera, right? And this poses quite some threats, actually. And what do you do, for example, if the technology fails? For example, if it leads you at a place, or if you get so focused on something that's actually virtual, then what, and that you don't see there is a road in front of you, and who's liable for this? And yeah, ownership of data. Who has the right to the data that you track here, that you record, that you collect about yourself? This is also questions that are not really solved yet. And one thing that I haven't mentioned so far is the system is actually persuasive. So 
do you know what persuasive technology is? Who knows what persuasive technology is? Okay. So, so yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, persuasive technology is actually is using computers to make you do things you might not want to do and think things you might not want to think. Uh, what does this mean? So, like I said, this technology is largely about adding value. So you add information into space, and we somehow perceive that and interpret it and use it for whatever reason. However, as we've seen before, our perception is quite easily to manipulate. So we've heard, before Easter, we've heard about Google PageRank. The first entry is the thing we deem as the most important. This actually has a name, it's called primacy, because the first thing we hear and the last thing we hear is important to us, and the middle part, which is do not memorize. I mean, the last part of Google PageRank we do never see, so the first thing is very important. Then other uh, aspects, if for example, we simultaneously presented information is much more easily to analyze than information that is presented sequently after each other. And we overrate, for example, desired information. So if you are convinced about a subject and you get an argument that supports your conviction, then you find it's much more important than information that contradicts your Conviction, conviction. And a co coherent presentation of a relationship or connection is, makes us pretty much blind for everything we do not mention. So if someone tells you a nice story and you think it makes sense, you basically disregard everything he has not mentioned. And we overrate vivid information. So if you have something talks to you, something, uh, shows you something, you can actually do something while taking up this information, you value it much more than if you just read it somewhere. Also, we've heard about neuroscience and neuromarketing. So this is interesting. You might have an ad in your HoloLens, and it might actually just be there all the time, right? And it adheres to all those principles we've heard before. Then this here, we see social att attachments, so object with a face, we've discussed this before, this is basically at this point, will read much more uh, attention than maybe just a sign or something. And this, the story, that's how we organize information is basically this thing again, right? Just proven by neuroscience. Now, R is, applications are much better than persuasion than we humans. So we might persuade each other as well, right? But this technology is even better than us. And mixed reality is even better than augmented reality because it's more integrated. You cannot distinguish it as, much, as well as augmented reality. Why is this? So, as we've said, it's ubiquitous. It's always there. So, it gets to be very persistent. It can remind you all the time that you have to buy this now. While maybe a human would have already given up now. Then, it's personalizable and it collects your data, so it might adjust its technology to how you think, how you feel, how you, what your interests are. And it's anonymous, you cannot argue back against it, you cannot say you're wrong, because it doesn't give you an answer, it just focuses on what it has to say. And because it's personalizable and because it's always there, it can seamlessly switch between multiple modalities of influencing you. So if it realizes, oh, you do not care much about this kind of influencing, then it might switch to something else. And because it has lots of data about you, it can do so quite easily. Now maybe just a little information about what this personal data actually is. So like you said, it can track your gaze, it can see what you look at, it can recognize faces in the future maybe, it can recognize objects and deduct what are your social interests, what are interests in general, what's your social life, who you do meet, who do you meet with? It can track your location, which is context as well. So for example, with a GPS sensor, you can just basically see if you're running, walking, driving. You don't need anything else, and this has much more information. 
you can access social media, and maybe sometimes it can even, um, if you combine it, for example, with a smartwatch, it might track your heartbeat, it might uh, track your temperature, maybe in the future hormones, and deduct what are your emotions, what is your context if you're running or whatever, if you're angry, if you're happy, and then use this information to adjust how it persuades you. Persuades you. Persuades you. So what does this mean? It's a persuasive technology, and it actually implicates our autonomy, right? Because, in fact, the way we use this technology is that these machines relieve us of the, um, the fact that we have to make decisions, right? We live in a very complex society now. We, want, we have to make decisions all the time. And therefore, we have these gadgets to help us make those decisions. But in fact, what they do is they do decisions for us a little bit. So it's actually a trade-off with uh, losing our autonomy over our own decisions. Maybe you can word it differently. You say, on the one hand, you have personalization and fast decision-making. On the other hand, you have unbiased, private, and non-persuasive decisions or environments. And to me personally, this also uh, raises the question of what is desired information and what is information that we actually have to see. So who decides what information I get to see and what information I have to see, for example. Because you can say, okay, this person absolutely has to see this information to be able to decide. And someone can say, no, this person does not have to see this information to be able to decide. And this is also sort of a trade-off. And some sort of final trade-off I see in connection with this technology is that on one hand you have objective and generally valid decisions and that, yeah, on the other hand, you have subjective, subjectivity and imperfections. So this is basically us, right? And this is what we attribute to technology in some sort of way. Of course, this mixes together even more so now. So, um, much faster than I want. Um, my opinion, and now I'm interested in your opinion and ideas, what you think. So if I go back to these trade-offs, what do you think about it? Where do you think that we have to draw the line between these? So for example, if you take this one, where should we draw the line? How much information do you want on your devices? Or are you, where do you think you're still making your own decisions? If someone gives you information about taking, where do you want, if you have to go this way, then that way, then this way. So is this still your own decision then? Is this just a suggestion or is it already somehow a decision made for you? Also, maybe, I mean, I said before, if, you, if I left something out, then this might just be disregarded, so maybe you have other ideas if, if I left something out, other implications I might have missed. Or how would you weigh personalization and unbiasedness? Would you rather have a perfectly biased system or unbiased system where you have to invest lots of energy to make all your decisions by yourself? Or and what information do you think we absolutely have to see? So for it to be an unbiased system completely. And how do you think this will affect our notion of presence? So if I get to have sort of an online presence and virtual uh, presence as well, this will directly affect our lives. And how do you think this will be? Also, what solutions would you propose for this? to avoid abusion of this technology. And maybe this is also interesting, if one day this becomes actually available as a mass production, would you use it? And under what conditions maybe would you use it? So, yeah, I've been much faster than <laughs> when 
uh, uh, yeah, before, so this will be the end of my presentation. Thank you.